Dana Miller presents the ninth Annual Obesity Conference, a practical look at obesity, diabetes, and current strategies. Featuring Ethan Lazarus, MD, Practical Medication Management for Obesity Treatment. So uh, let's switch gears and talk about uh, pharmacotherapy. Hey, you fixed it, at least so far. Um, objectives. Okay, so I want to do this mostly based on talking about patient examples. I find that that's going to help us take this knowledge home a little bit better. And any patient I put up, there's going to be 20 ways to do this. So you might come up with something different than what I come up with. But uh, we'll start with an example. Now, this is a factitious patient, but uh, you probably saw her this week. I mean, has anybody seen this patient this week? She's 38. She has type 2 diabetes. She has a body mass index of 31. She has uh, hypertension, insomnia. Um, and uh, so how would you treat this patient? Let's do a show of hands, all right? So that nobody can fall asleep while I'm speaking. I make sure I keep you moving. So how many people would start her on a generic anti-obesity medication? Got a couple of hands. How many people would start her on a brand name anti-obesity medication? So we got two for generic, a half for brand. Who would do a sleep study to make sure she doesn't have sleep apnea? Got three more. Who would tell the patient to eat less, exercise more? And who would ask her what medication she's on? Who would do a history? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the first thing we do in medicine is a history, but isn't it funny? Patients go to see their doctor. Doctor, I've been struggling with my weight. I've been working on this forever. I really, I'm trying to lose it and nothing's working. What can I do? Well, eat less, exercise more. <laughs> I mean, we, we wouldn't do that for any other health condition. We would first do a history, right? So we do a history. I'm not saying any of the others aren't places we might want to end up at. They're all reasonable. But first, we do a history. So again, I made this up. What if for the diabetes, she's on metformin, glimepiride. Do you guys remember glimepiride, amaryl? Does anybody still use that one? And her A1C is fine. For her blood pressure, she's on, she's on atenolol and hydrochlorothiazide because up until a few years ago, everybody had to be on beta blockers, right? And, oh, she can't sleep, so she's on amitriptyline. Right? We got some problems in this medication list. And I would argue that unless you address those problems first, even if we take weight off, she's just going to regain it for the same reason she gained it in the first place. So we've got to address that medication list. So just a reminder, I, I don't care if we're talking about obesity or diabetes, you've got to look at every drug the patient's on, um, whether it's from the primary care or the specialist or from yourself. And you need to think about medications that are iatrogenic for weight gain. This is a funny concept for the primary care provider who for many decades didn't want to write down the diagnosis of, ob diagnosis of obesity because then the insurance wouldn't pay for the visit. So if we're not going to even write the diagnosis of obesity, we're going to pick drugs like amitriptyline to help the patient sleep, right? So it seems that providers are getting better about this and not giving a heavier patient a drug that's going to exacerbate weight gain. But I can tell you 99% of my new patients are on drugs causing weight gain, 99%. It's almost every single one of them. Okay, let's try this side for a minute. This foot's getting tired. So this is a table that I put together. Um, sorry, do you guys get copies of the decks? Yes, so then I'm not going to read through this. You can pull this as reference. Um, my references for this, there's two. There's the Blackburn. Um, that reference is a, a book he wrote uh, that I got from him back at the Harvard Obesity Course. He called it uh, Breaking Through Your Set Point. Um, now, I disagree with a lot of what he says in the book, even though I think he's one of the giants in the field. He basically says to set small goals and then set more small goals. So lose, try to lose 5% and then wait a while and then try to lose 5 more percent. I, I don't think recent studies have supported that approach, but still a very good read. And his table uh, and appendixes in the back have excellent information. And then I also took this from the Endocrine Society's um, review of pharmacotherapy. So in their review of weight loss pharmacotherapy, the first three quarters of the document goes over drugs that cause weight gain. So it's like the, the core of the document is getting off of drugs that cause weight gain if you can. So uh, we all know that paroxetine can cause a lot of weight gain, right? And we all, that we'll all know that bupropion could potentially cause weight loss. But, I mean, getting a person off paroxetine is very, very hard. 
uh, once they're on it, they, they, it's tough to go off it. So getting really good with these mental health drugs or having a psychiatrist to refer to that can help you with that uh, is really key. Um, so probably worst in class paroxetine, probably best in class is sertraline um, when it comes to the SSRIs. Um, anti-epileptic drugs, um, most of them can cause a lot of trouble. Antipsychotics, atypical antipsychotics, including the more weight neutral ones. Look, ziprazidone being one of the most weight neutral, still causing 7% weight gain, right? So we've got a lot of trouble um, uh, among these medication classes. So if I was just going to go over some of my favorite drugs, um, sometimes I'll send a letter to the psychiatrist, hey, are any of these options? Um, obviously, um, uh, bupropion, sertraline, um, Lamotrigine as a mood stabilizer, probably the most weight neutral. Um, and then down here, if they have to be on an antipsychotic and there's not another option, um, can we offset that with topiramate or can we offset that with metformin? Both off-label uses for those drugs. Um, steroids, I mean, most of the patients aren't managed on chronic steroid anymore unless they have to be. Um, sedating antihistamines, you know where patients are still getting their sedating antihistamines? All their over-the-counter sleeping aids, right? Hey doc, I take Tylenol PM to help sleep, is that okay? Well, if it's okay if you want to not get good REM sleep and be hungry all day tomorrow. So if they're going to take that once in a while with, when they travel, fine, but most patients that are using it are using it daily, and I try to think about other options. Um, diabetes, you know, all of the older drugs for the most part other than the metformin are going to cause weight gain and most of the new drugs actually can give weight loss. We'll talk about those. Um, beta blockers, I mean, they were first line antihypertensives for decades. The more recent antihypertensive guidelines recommend not starting with beta blockers. But how many of your patients that have been on beta blockers for decades did you take off and move to something else? So I've got all these patients that are still on it. It's right, it's much easier to start something than stop it, right? It was started 13 physicians ago and they're stable, so why would we change it? But uh, we think beta blockers can slow metabolism as much as 15%. And think about your postmenopausal woman who already can uh, you know, drive from here to Washington, D.C. and only use one gallon of gas, right? We don't need to make her even more fuel efficient with a beta blocker. And then uh, d does anybody still use a, a Depo-Provera? Yeah, some patients. So the data on that is some patients are sensitive to weight gain from that, some aren't. The ones that are will gain weight early and quickly and never lose it. Well, these hormonally induced weight gains, do you see it just come right off when you stop the treatment? <laughs> no, I mean, it gets stuck. It's hard to get that weight back off. So again, this example, patient number one, I mean, we could stop the glimepiride, the amaryl, and add any other of the more modern diabetes medications that are either weight neutral or weight loss. You could do a DPP-4 um, for weight neutral, or you could do a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2 for weight loss, if you're comfortable with those medications. It's pretty easy to take her off a tenolol. I just caution you, if you're going to do that, wean it so their heart doesn't race, unless you have some other reason to be on it. Think about an ACE inhibitor, angiotensin blocker, hydrochlorothiazide, calcium channel blocker. And then there's lots of approaches to come off amitriptyline, maybe just using a behavioral approach. I mean, does she really need to be on medication to sleep? I prescribe a lot of trazodone um, for sleep. So that takes us to the anti-obesity medications. Uh, there, there's just one take home point. I'm gonna make this again and again and again. Um, when uh, we were working at the AMA to recognize whether obesity should be a disease or not, this came up over and over and over. Um, obesity is a disease. It's like hypertension or diabetes. It's there forever. It doesn't go away after three months. So if you're going to treat obesity with a medication for three months, you might as well treat hypertension with a medication for three months. Just don't do it. If that's all that's available to you, you're not doing the patient any benefit uh, with a three-month treatment. Also, that the medications don't work in the vacuum. So all of the anti-obesity medications, read the label, they're the same. They're indicated for weight management as an adjunct to reduce calorie diet and phys increase physical activity. I would just call that a behavioral program. So if the patient comes in, doc, I wanna lose weight, you don't just give them a prescription for the weight loss medication. It has to be part of a program. Even if that program is self-directed, I mean, your patient could be doing Weight Watchers, you could augment it with uh, medication. Um, I've done that, I had a patient right when I took over my practice, 2004, she'd been a patient at the practice for eons, and she was 80 when I met her, and she says to me, um, I want you to medically manage me, um, but she says, I don't want any medication and I want to go to Weight Watchers. 
So I wasn't exactly sure what she wanted me to do, um, but she didn't lose weight at all for years. Um, but she came in and saw me once a quarter for follow-up, and I asked her why uh, she didn't want to use medication, and she had a uh, complicated history. And eventually I put her on the smallest dose of diethylpropion, tenuate, 25 milligrams a day. And uh, she still comes to our clinic. She comes once a quarter, just like she's always done. And in the last uh, 12 years, she's lost 109 pounds. She's in her 90s. And she tells me she's uh, at the best uh, weight of her life. Doing what she wants to do, right? So this is just a quick list. You all know these. These are your different medications that are available. Uh, we've got the old ones, the phenermine. Um, diethylpropion, a lot of people haven't heard of, but I actually really like that one. It used to be called Tenuate. And then uh, Fendimetrazine, which act as a mild stimulant. If you think back to the uh, diagram of uh, um, neurobiology that Dr. Heinrich showed, these are all working in the hypothalamus. Uh, they work in the, uh, it's called the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. They stimulate it and they make you not want to eat. So when I put a person on uh, Fendermine or Tenuate, they just tell me it's like a light switch. Like while it's working, they just don't really want to eat. And then when it wears off, the light comes on and they're hungry again. So it's really more uh, of, of a true, we call it an appetite suppressant, although I don't like that term anymore. We've moved to anti-obesity medication. The term anti-obesity medication implies we're treating a disease. Appetite suppressant to me sounds like you're using a medication for a headache, right? Take it if you're hungry. So like if you have a headache, you take Tylenol, right? If you're hungry, take uh, appetite suppressant. So we've really tried to run away from that term and use... Uh, I use the term weight loss medication because obesity is considered a stigmatizing term. Uh, if, you, if you use the word obesity, people hear fat. Uh, and so we use the term weight loss medication. Does anybody here have a better suggestion for what they like to call the medications? What do you guys use in your clinics? Appetite suppressant, weight loss medication, AOM, diet pills. Patients come in all the time, right? And they're like, oh, I don't want any of those diet pills. <laughs> I say, I, I don't know of any FDA approved diet pills, but would you like something for chronic weight management? So I try to dispel that one. Um, and there's a lot of doctors that'll say that I don't believe in diet pills. And so I'll, I'll write a letter to that diet. I'm not sure what you're referring to. I've never seen a, a, a drug that's FDA approved for diet. Um, but we have these ones that are FDA approved for weight management. So I try to move just to better terms. Uh, Orlistat, does any pre anybody prescribe Orlistat? A couple people, yeah. Um, pancreatic lipase inhibitor. Um, we have the phenermine with topiramate uh, extended release, uh, the lorcasserin, the naltrexone with bupropion, and the liraglutide 3 milligrams. So we'll go over those uh, in the coming slides. Again, this is a reference. I'm not going to read it to you, um, but it gives you a really nice spot if you want to have all of your drugs on uh, one piece of paper. Um, you can have the mechanism of action, the contraindications, and the stoppage rules. Um, the highlighted ones are in bold. Uh, the sympathomimetics I would avoid in a few situations, so the phenermine and the tenuate and the fendimetrazine. Um, I'd avoid it if the patient has uh, hard to control high blood pressure. Um, I'd avoid them if the patient has bipolar disorder, generally speaking. Um, and I would avoid it if the patient has uh, atherosclerotic heart disease or other heart problems uh, without a cardiologist's consent. So uh, any condition where you don't want to speed the heart up, I'd be real careful with those. Uh, Orlistat, um, I'd avoid if your patient doesn't own dark pants. <laughs> uh, phenermine topiramate, it's in the label. I didn't make that one up. Um, the phenermine with topiramate ER, a brand name Qsimia. Just remember that the topiramate is teratogenic. This drug should not be used in women of childbearing potential unless you follow their, they have a REMS program. You need to follow it and make sure you've done adequate contraceptive counseling and testing. Um, for women of childbearing potential, an intact uterus. Um, Lurcaserin, um, uh, uh, marketed as Belvic, which works as a serotonin agonist. So it's not actually serotonin, but it uh, stimulates the serotonin receptor. I hear people say it's not a stimulant, which is true. It doesn't have stimulant properties, but technically it is. It's just stimulating serotonin. So that one's interesting. That's actually a very calming drug. Um, in fact, people take it and they sleep really well. So if you have a patient with a lot of sleep issues that gets revved up from a cup of coffee, um, lurcasserin could be one to consider. Um, it interacts with pretty much every mental health drug. It's not really an interaction, but they don't want to get the serotonin levels too high because of that risk of serotonin syndrome. Although in their clinical trials, there are only two suspected cases, and both were on 
um, other drugs that may have caused it. Um, I think one of them was dextromethorphan. And so I always caution patients not to use dextromethorphan over the counter, St. John's Wort over the counter. All right. When this first came out, I wouldn't prescribe it if the patient was on an SSRI or any other serotonin drug. Honestly, these days, that's a warning. It's not a contraindication. So nowadays, I'll do that cautiously if they're on one at a standard dose. If they're a real high dose or on two, I usually would still steer clear. Um, the naltrexone bupropion ER, of course, that's naltrexone with Welbutrin. And uh, this one has all the contraindications and, and warnings that Welbutrin does with regarding seizure, but also we wouldn't use it if the patient was on any type of narcotic, um, since the naltrexone will interfere with the narcotic. And then finally, liraglutide, which is uh, uh, basically high dose Victoza. Um, the liraglutide, though, was only studied for weight loss. That's why you won't see mention of A1C in the package insert. So if you're treating diabetes, like how do you pick? You've got these two options. Uh, if you're treating the diabetes, you treat with the Victoza. And if you're treating for weight loss, you treat with the uh, Saxenda. And you need to be careful with this for your multitudes of patients with a history of medullary thyroid carcinoma or MEN2. Has anybody seen those? I have two. I have two with uh, MTC. Uh, two patients had a personal history of medullary thyroid carcinoma. So um, they say that that type of cancer is quite common in uh, both genders, not just boys or girls, but both genders of mice and rats. So you should be very cautious with uh, liraglutide in your rodent population. Uh, but for humans, if there's no history or family history, still counsel about it, feel their neck every time you see them, um, and just do good documentation. Um, in terms of the side effects, the sympathomimetics um, can be a little bit stimulating. Honestly, after 15 years of using these medications, it, it, what's, what's listed as a side effect most people like. When you put a person on phenamine or diethylpropion, most people feel terrific. Um, it's like people say the, 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 the curtain went up and I've got energy and I can focus and my grades got better. Most people do really well. Uh, the usual side effect I see is dry mouth. That's the biggie. And some people feel compelled to clean the garage at two in the morning the first few days. Um, if it's too stimulating or their brain's racing or they get agitated or irritable, we take them off and do something else. Uh, the oralistat uh, we talked about. Uh, the uh, phenamine topiramate ER, so it's interesting. You would think that the, the phenamine would be stimulating, the topiramate might make them fuzzy thinking, but it's actually very well tolerated. Um, the main side effect I see on that one is that the wallet gets thinner. The naltrexone bupropion SR, that one, the main side effects are going to be gastrointestinal, um, nausea, constipation, and then um, sometimes the reactions from the bupropion. And then uh, the liraglutide, usually if there's side effects, it's gastrointestinal side effects. Um, that, that one's also tremendously expensive for those of you that have prescribed it. It's uh, uh, over $1,000 a month. Uh, but for patients uh, that are on it, um, I only use it when there's insurance coverage. And uh, the different states all have very different insurance coverage. Um, my average patient spends 35 bucks on uh, uh, liraglutide, so they're getting it for the same cost as the generics. Um, but I only have coverage for about one out of 10 of my patients. Uh, so when I have coverage, it's an option. Um, just some considerations. Um, I listed here the A1C reductions. Again, that was a secondary endpoint that they looked at. Um, look at that, the uh, Qsimia, A1C reduction 0.9. Belvique, A1C reduction 0.9. Uh, in the three-year study that Dr. Heinrich had up, I didn't put that one in here. Um, but they, that was a heart safety study. And so they said at three years, the lorcaserin seems to be safe for the heart, there wasn't uh, a significant increase in the heart risk, which is great news. But then they said, oh, and by the way, uh, the A1C reduction was uh, unexpected. So who knows if uh, that's a drug that they should, uh, should have been studying for another disease. Um, so we see it do really well. I'm gonna give you an example of that right at the end. Um, now, Trexone, uh, liraglutide are not controlled substances, and then the Oralistat, of course, to wear dark pants. <laughs> Everybody clear on our meds? Can we switch gears, show you how I use them? All right. So stoppage rules. So everybody reads this and that means, oh, so am I supposed to stop the medication? That's not what this means at all. So if you put a person on a high blood pressure medication and their blood pressure didn't go down, would you continue the medication? Yes? If their blood pressure didn't go down? No, no. okay. You gotta make sure you're, you're awake over here. Um, well, maybe if you were putting them on it for renal protection or something. 
But similarly with weight, the concern would be that we put a person on a drug and it doesn't do anything and we keep them on it. So I don't know why we need stoppage rules. We don't have that for any other class of drug. Do you have any other drug that it tells you that you have to stop it in three months if X, Y, and Z doesn't happen? I would love an example. Um, the other thing our FDA did, which I love, is they approved four new drugs in two years and they gave every one of them a different rule. They're all slightly different. I mean, that's just crazy. Couldn't they have just said 5% at three months and called it quits for all weight loss drugs? But they didn't. And so they made each of them a little different. So if you want to know the exact stoppage rules, I printed them out for you. They're in the package inserts. These become important if you're submitting to insurance. So if you've got your drug covered by insurance, they are going to ask you if the patient achieved the proper weight loss by the stoppage rule. I don't want to read all those to you. Okay, so I put in one slide on each drug. Again, I did this more for reference. I, I think I've already basically talked about this, uh, but phenamine and diethylpropion, talked about when to avoid them. Again, they're inexpensive, they're effective, they're established. There's a misperception they should only be used for short term. Uh, I, I would like to communicate that's a misperception because the drugs came to market around 1959. Uh, back in the 50s, when weight loss medications were studied, the requirement by the FDA was a three-month study. And so the drug would come to market with a three-month safety study indicated for short-term use for weight loss. In addition, I believe the number uh, included in the original phenamine study was 339. Can you imagine approving a drug with 339 people after three months? So that's where we were 59 years ago. Um, current evidence doesn't support that we should use these drugs short term, even though that's what's in the label. And certain states right now still don't allow you to use these drugs beyond short term. Um, I would say if, if that's the rule in the state, then just don't use them. I, I can't think of any situation where a three month treatment would be worth doing. Um, just so you know, uh, at our last AMA meeting, and I'm, gosh, I'm back here next week for uh, AMA in, in Washington. At our last AMA meeting, I wrote uh, on behalf of Obesity Medicine Association and passed a resolution dealing with this problem. And it's the official um, policy of the American Medical Association. If you're interested, I'll send it to you, uh, that the AMA supports uh, physicians to be able to uh, practice obesity treatment without state interference regarding the current standard of care. So if you believe the current standard of care is chronic treatment, um, and your state has a rule against that, for example, Ohio, um, AMA will actually legislate in that state to remove these restrictions. There's only a few states left that have such severe restrictions. Um, diethylpropion versus phenamine. If you've never used diethylpropion, it's available in two doses, a 25 milligram um, that would be intended to take three times a day or a 75 milligram intended to take once a day. So we usually do a 75 milligram in the morning. It works better on an empty stomach. Patients get a real dry mouth, but otherwise, in general, do very well with this one. Um, if you haven't used this with your patients, just think about it like a phenamine with less side effects. Um, and we've had very good experience with this one. You know, a lot of my patients think, well, um, you know, if you want to lose more weight, go to more phenamine. Or, you know, is phenamine more effective than tenuate? Have you ever noticed there's no head-dead studies between any of our drugs? And um, so I don't have a head-dead study show you, but I can take you data from uh, several hundred patients in my clinic. And I just asked, um, again, right around New Year's last year, um, for my system to pull all my patients on phenamine at all doses and all my patients attenuate in all doses. I, there were a lot more curves here. I just picked out these three. Um, and in my patient population, you can see in the red line a 37.5 phenamine, in the blue line a 30 milligram phenamine, and in the green line a 75 milligram tenuate. And what do you notice when you look at those three curves? Not a big difference. There may be, a st statistician might come up with something else. There's another thing I notice on this though. And again, if you compare this to any of the weight loss trials, um, look at the slope of that curve. They lose a bunch of weight. By about seven months, they've hit maximum weight loss, and then they regain a little bit. That's a pretty typical weight loss curve that you're going to see in any pharmaceutical study, let alone in my clinic, which wasn't a study. And then here you can see um, an average at 24 months of 23 pounds of weight loss. Since our average patient's around 200 pounds, that's probably about a 10% at two years for the ones I was able to get tracking on. 
uh, the the fentramine to pyramid ER, uh, I think we've already talked about it. I mean, th this is really nice for somebody that wants to take one pill in the morning and get a lot of weight loss from it. Um, they get a really nice effect from the fentramine for the first half of the day and then from the topiramate for the second half of the day. Um, in our clinic, because this one's expensive, uh, we do a lot of generic fentramine, generic topiramate on top of it. Uh, that would be an off-label use of topiramate. Uh, typically, if we're going to do that, um, we usually start them on the fentramine first and then add the topiramate if we get stuck. Uh, typically, if I do the topiramate, I'll just start them at 25 milligrams. I tell them to take it before bed for two weeks to minimize side effects. And then uh, over time, I'll ratchet it up. Usually, we'll go to either 50 or 100 milligrams. Watch for the cognitive side effects with word finding. And then I don't know if any of you have you seen this. Uh, I get some patients that tell me their GPS chip in their head malfunctions. <laughs> I have a uh, critical care doctor I'm working with, and she's super smart. She's done super awesome. She has type 1 diabetes. She had tried everything on earth to lose weight and uh, came to see me, and we've done really well together. And I added topiramate, and she did great with her weight. But she stopped it after a month, and I asked her why. And she works at a, a critical care at the hospital, and she always gets off like at midnight. And she says for four or five nights in a row, she couldn't find her car <laughs> in the parking lot. She had to call security. And she's such a smart woman. She says, I, it's scary. I, I'm just worried about it. And, uh, it's only healthcare providers that can't find their car. I did. I had another nurse. She told me she couldn't find her house. Said she got lost in her neighborhood. So just be careful with the topiramate. Increase it really slowly. It doesn't take a lot. You can usually stop at 50 milligrams. Um, and I tell them it doesn't matter when they take it. So everybody thinks about it as an appetite suppressant, but I think the topiramate likely has weight loss mechanisms outside of just the appetite center. So we see them get good weight loss on it regardless of the time of day that they'll take it. Uh, the Belvique we've already talked about, it's not a stimulant. I love it for patients with trouble sleeping or with trouble with um, um, being overstimulated. But honestly, um, I think uh, Dr. Heinrich uh, touched on this too. Uh, when used as sole therapy, um, it has not wowed me. I have had a few patients do extremely well on it, but as, as solo therapy, it's a pretty mild to modest effect. And as the years have gone on, even though it's off-label, I've been using this primarily as part of combination therapy. And as part of a combination, it can be awesome. I'm going to show you a sample patient in a few slides. Again, any combination of anything is considered off-label. And the uh, bupropion ER naltrexone or Contrave, this works really well for people with weird food cravings, irrational food thoughts. I had one patient told me she was dreaming of pancakes. Um, the Contrave, it's very interesting. I think about it working one brain center up from the others, um, where instead of just turning off your appetite, it's getting more into the craving center and calming down those thoughts. Uh, I had a patient, uh, I started on this, and she came and she was crying like a month later. I'm like, what's wrong? She says, uh, is this what a normal person is supposed to feel like? I mean, she'd just been consumed with thoughts about food all the time, and she started on this, and she said, I'm just, I still get hungry and I eat and I'm full, but I'm just not thinking about food all day. So it's a very interesting effect. Um, I had a patient I saw yesterday um, who's been a long timer. She's been on Wellbutrin for depression, and um, we decided to add the naltrexone. Um, so, you know, again, it's, uh, it would be off-label to do it with generics, but it works great. I started her on a half of a naltrexone 50 for a month, uh, for two weeks, and then we went up to 50. And she tells me um, that her mood's improved, her anxiety's gone away, and she's sleeping better. I don't know if that's a naltrexone effect, or if you read about naltrexone, it potentiates Wellbutrin a little bit. Uh, it may be that we've given her a relative increase in her Wellbutrin effect, but uh, she lost 10 pounds in her first month. And she's been a real challenging uh, patient over the years to get weight off. She was uh, ecstatic um, about that change. Now, Trexone's available at the, at the pharmacy. It's not expensive. And then the, the raglatide, three milligrams. We talked about when to avoid it. This one's different. I mean, the GLP-1 has uh, lots of different mechanisms in different areas of hunger. Excuse me. So it's totally different. If you start your patient on the uh, liraglutide, they tell you they physically can't eat. They like want to eat, they sit down, they're ready to eat, they start eating, and then they can't eat. And so I think that the part of that's the effect of GLP-1 on the stomach where the stomach stops peristalsing. The stomach doesn't want to accept food. Um, and so uh, it's very interesting. People uh, eat less, they stop eating qu quicker, their uh, cravings go away, very powerful medication. Once a day injection. So this slide is looking uh, at categorical weight loss. So that's what percentage of patients, uh, excuse me, that's the next slide. This slide's looking at pounds of weight loss above placebo 
um, from the drug labels with the caveat that these drug studies were all done differently. The way they were evaluated statistically was different. The way they accounted for lost data was different. But what I like to just show is that all of them take weight off. All right. And certainly the Qsimia data was pretty powerful. And then the Contrave data, because they did an intensive behavior modification program, um, was their strongest study. So all of them work. Categorical weight loss is showing you what proportion achieves either a 5 or a 10% weight loss. Um, I'm waiting for 15 or 20% weight loss. And by the way, I think we'll be getting that in the next few years. Can you imagine a medication that could take off 20% body weight? It would be bad business for Dr. Morton. Um, but you can see, what I like to tell people looking at this data is the medications, whichever one you pick, double to triple the odds of losing at least 5 to 10% body weight. It's a nice way to remember that. Uh, can phenamine be used long term? Well, any use of phenamine long term would be uh, specifically off label, even if you're using it at the same dose that's in Qsimia. So phenamine will not be relabeled that it's appropriate for chronic use, at least not in my lifetime. So if you're using more than 12 weeks and 12 months, that's an off label use. I would document that you're doing it. You need to make sure that's safe in your state. I would document a discussion with your patient while you're doing it, that your patient knows that it's off-label. I would write why you were doing it, what are the benefits, and I would make sure you counseled on the risks. Um, but we do use phenamine uh, chronically. Uh, if you want something to hang your hat on, I've given you two references. One's a position statement published by Obesity Medicine uh, Association, and the other is the Apovian article. So if you pull the pharmacotherapy statement, that's published by the Endocrine Society. Uh, in their peer review journal, the last paragraph deals with long-term use of phenamine. I copied it here. Seems reasonable for clinicians to prescribe phenamine long-term uh, as long as there's no evidence of serious cardiovascular disease, psychiatric disease, substance abuse, been informed that there are other treatments that are approved for long-term use, does not demonstrate uh, hemodynamic response and gets a significant weight loss. So I, I love that guideline. I use it every day. This was the AMA resolution. Uh, sorry, I forgot I'd added this to the slide set late. Uh, resolved that our AMA work with interested state medical societies and other stakeholders to remove out-of-date restrictions at the state and federal level prohibiting healthcare providers from providing the current standard of care to patients affected by obesity. So if we're going to accept endocrine society as establishing a standard of care, then uh, this would apply in states like Ohio. Um, why medication to maintain weight loss? Because when you lose weight, you get a big bump in appetite, which is hormonal. It's not that you run out of willpower. It's that your hunger hormones go out of whack, and they want to trigger a weight regain. You get elevated ghrelin and decrease in all the satisfaction hormones, and the metabolism goes into the toilet. This is not what the patients want, right? Everybody that's been doing this forever, everybody comes in, they request the same thing. I'm going to lose weight and boost my metabolism. That's not how it works. You don't go from driving a Suburban to a Toyota Prius and burn more gas. That's just not how it works. And so because we have these opposing mechanisms, oh, the other thing I tell patients, this, has, this doesn't matter if you're heavy or you're thin. If I lose weight, you lose weight, you lose weight, that's just a weight loss mechanism. We're all going to do the same thing, right? Everybody's body, when you lose weight, has protective mechanisms. The body wants to protect its fat and its lean stores. And the body's going to work really hard to uh, protect itself. And so those mechanisms kick in again, whether you're thin or heavy. And that's where I think uh, this Sumithrin study, if you're going to read one study, pull this one. It's really good. Uh, talks about um, how, how a lot of this data w was generated. Again, it's one of my favorite studies that I've read. If you can't find it, uh, email me. If you need my email, just get it, get it from me at the end of my talk. Uh, if you have trouble remembering uh, emails, just remember my name, ethanlazarus at gmail.com, um, and I'll uh, send you a link to that study. Um, but it makes sense that if you're going to have health benefits from sustaining weight loss and your biology is trying to push your weight back up, that we would use medication for that. Because we now have a hormonal basis for why people regain weight, telling a person to keep weight off just by changing how they eat or how they move would be like asking a woman to skip her menstrual cycle just by eating or moving differently. It's just not that easy, right? So remember, there's a hormonal basis for this. I'm going to show you t one study and my internal data. Again, this is data I pulled from my electronic health record. 
And now what I did is I took in the blue line, these are people that have been on a full meal replacement program over, uh, they started with it and then I continued them out and I got two year data. That's in blue. And you can see if I treated them with medication, did it make a difference in the first six months? I don't think so. So it's interesting, we call it a weight loss medication, but if they're doing a full meal replacement, we're already regulating their calories so well that the medication's not adding that much since it's mainly working in the brain. People wonder, does phenamine, does it mainly work in the brain or is it mainly metabolism? The main mechanism of action is changing how you eat. So if you've got a person on full meal replacement and they're tolerating it, um, the medication would basically serve to make it more comfortable if they're just hungry. But the way they're making the meal replacements these days, most patients feel pretty good on them. But look what happens if we don't get them on medication. So that's what I'm seeing in real world data. Again, that, that data is not scrubbed. I just pulled it right out of the health, health record. But to me, there's, you asked when, somebody asked me when I would start it. And I said by nine months, that's why. That's what I based that answer on. So how do I choose? So, you know, is the patient a candidate for a weight loss medication? Yes or no? And if they're not a candidate, don't give it to them. If they are a candidate, do they want it? So I ask, I always ask patients, are, um, are you interested in talking about weight loss medications? And usually I get a yes or no. Most of my patients these days it's yes, but I still get a fair amount of no and I'll ask why. And they'll say, because my doctor told me not to take diet pills. I get that all the time. Or they're dangerous. Or I don't need it. I can just use willpower. Or I'm not hungry. A lot of my patients that don't want my medic me want medication are my patients that would benefit the most. The patients that tell me they don't want medication are my diet professionals, that this is the 15th attempt and they know what they're doing and the BMI is 48. And they don't want surgery either. So they don't want two of the best evidence tools. And I call them on it. I, I ask them, do you really want to lose weight? Why are you really here? And they'll tell me because, well, I know how to lose the weight. I just can't keep it off. And I'm like, well, then why aren't we talking about medication? Because it's one of your single best tools that would double or triple your odds of doing that. And so if they say they don't want medication, how many of you have patients with high cholesterol? Right? You check it, it's 300. The LDL is 210. Oh, I don't believe in medication. Why not? Because the, the statins cause too much side effects. They're deadly. It's going to ruin my liver. Have your patients ever told you that? Do you say, okay. Do you let them walk out of your office and just refuse it? Or would you educate them on the benefits of the statin? Right? You're going to let them make an informed choice. You are free not to take the statin. I'm not going to force you to do it. I think you're at an unacceptably high risk of uh, having a heart attack in the next 10 years. And you calculate it out. Whoa, you got 23% risk of a heart attack in 10 years. You sure? I think you'd tolerate one. And I think we'd do it. And you'd have no side effects. You wouldn't even know you're on it. And hey, if you have any side effects, I'll take you off it immediately. Right? We would counsel our patients to make what we thought was the medical best choice. So that group that tells you no, maybe not at that first visit, uh, what I do with that group is I say, okay, great, let's get started on the full meal replacement. Medications work better to keep the weight off than to lose it. But I'd like to give you a handout on all the different medications for you to read about, and we'll talk about it in a couple months. So I educate and I sit down and talk about it with them. And if yes, then you've got to choose. How do you choose? Well, you know, most of your patients are going to have a contraindication to one or two of them, right? They're, they're thinking they might want to have kids and they're not on adequate contraception. We wouldn't do the Q-simia. They don't have insurance coverage. We're not going to do the Saxenda, right? They um, have hypertension. The blood pressure is 150. We're probably not going to do Phenermine. So first, just cross off the ones that you can't use. And you're usually left with maybe two, sometimes three. Uh, and in our clinic, typically, we'll start with the generics and then move to the brand name if the generics don't work but some patients will start out the door with a brand name drug. So I'm gonna give you some examples. I like that endocrine guideline that says that patients should be educated on all the treatment options. So I have a handout I made for my patients. I give everybody a handout with all the drugs listed. Be pretty easy for you to draw that up from this talk. Yeah, do I have a question? No. Yeah. No, that's one I use internally, but I consider it. Send me an email. I'll send it to you, all right? That it has um, a lot of our program information, so I'll take out the piece that's just on uh, medication for you. All right, so remember that 38-year-old that we talked about about 38 slides ago? Um, 
I mean, what would I treat her with? What would you guys treat her with? Let's say we adjusted all of her other medications. We fixed the amitriptyline. We fixed the atenolol. We fixed the glimepiride. She's still got an elevated body mass index and we want to treat her with a weight loss medication. Remember, she had no insurance coverage, right? And so as I was thinking about it, um, I'd say best options, I might do diethylpropion. It's generic. I think she'd tolerate it. But with her insomnia problem and her hypertension problem, I would definitely consider lorcaserin. Um, my concern there is it's going to be three times as expensive. And I might consider uh, bupropion ER naltrexone, but it's also three times as expensive and might aggravate the insomnia, might aggravate the um, high, high blood pressure for the first three months. Yeah. Zonisamide, I have not really used. Yeah, I used topiramate, but I haven't really gotten into the zonisamide bandwagon. Yeah, I should. Um, I should use it more. I keep thinking I want to do it. So maybe uh, if you could grab me after all this, you can talk me through how you like to use it. Um, I actually appreciate that. I remember it was in studies um, by uh, Orexogen. What was that going to be? Empatic? Um, but they never finished it. Yeah. So let me give you some real case examples. So um, I just pulled weight graphs and then uh, wrote out what we did with some patients. This is a 71-year-old woman. Body mass index is 32.9, treated for depression, which is in remission, um, treated for arthritis and for high cholesterol, citalopram, methotrexate, nebumatone, simvastatin, triamterine. Came in to see me. Actually, this is a nice story. She's the nicest uh, woman. She came in to see me because... Her kids and grandkids wanted her to go on a trip, um, and they wanted to go to Costa Rica and go zip lining. And she came in to see me because she was worried she wouldn't be able to make it up the steps to go to the zip lines. Um, and so that was her motivator. You know how people get a motivator and then they hit the ball out of the park? So she wanted to have fun with her grandkids even though she's 71. And uh, so she started a protein sparing modified fast, diethylpropion. And you can see really good weight loss out here till about day 230, and then she stabilized. Um, this was about where she was going to Costa Rica. And she says she ran up the steps and the kids couldn't keep up with her. They're saying, slow down, Grandma. She was so proud of herself. She's done two more trips since then. The last one, they went to the beach because they wanted to go, what's it called, the parasailing? So she brought me pictures of parasailing with the grandkids. And uh, so we did the, um, you can see we did the modified fast for four months. Then we advanced it. We added uh, fruit and dairy at that point is what we call advancing it. And then we balanced her out by day 300. And um, here I had moved her over to phenamine 30. She's regained a little. Uh, I talked to her about that a couple weeks ago. She's at about a 17, 18%. She's like, well, she's like, I like to eat out a couple times a week and this is good enough. I don't have to be at that lowest weight to be able to sprint up the steps. So um, when you're thinking about weight loss, there's something about 20% weight loss that's very hard. I mean, people that are going to maintain 20% um, that's like doing an Ironman triathlon to maintain that. And so we see a lot of our patients more comfortable maintaining a 16 or 18%, not, not quite as heroic. So again, really simple, straightforward, using the generic medication. Who's this? 41-year-old male, body mass index 42.6, with really bad heartburn, low back pain. He's an interesting guy. He works at a bank in customer service. Can you think of a worse job? <laughs> he's not on any medications. Um, he came in, we started him on a full meal replacement, and we started him on phenamine 30. He lost 33% uh, of his body weight, which uh, coincidentally was exactly 100 pounds. So I asked him uh, what was his motivation to lose the weight. He tells me that um, uh, he helps with the Boy Scouts, and his son's in the Boy Scouts, and his son wants to do this trekking, uh, hiking, you know, five-day thing or whatever it was in uh, Albuquerque. And they're supposed to trek 100 miles with 60-pound packs. And so his son asked him, Dad, will you do this hike with me? And his answer was, I don't think I can do it. And uh, after that settled in, uh, he turned him down and then he came to see me. Lost 100 pounds. And as he was losing, somebody else dropped off that hike. His son said, Dad, what about now? You think you could do that hike? And Dad said, I don't know. I'll try. And so right here, when he was down 100 pounds, he hiked 100 miles. He completed the hike. I asked him, how was it? He said, it was miserable. It rained every day. I've never been in so much pain. My feet hurt like crap, and I can't wait to do it next year. So here it gets more interesting. We start a weight regain cycle. Obviously, he's not training for the 100-mile hike anymore. 
But what was more interesting is he decided he hated his job. He looked at Craigslist and somebody was selling a carpet steamer in Colorado Springs, about 50 miles south of us. He um, Ubered to Colorado Springs and bought a carpet steaming truck and quit his job at uh, the bank on the same day. And now he runs his own business. He's got a waiting list for a month. He goes from house to house doing it all himself, steaming carpets. <laughs> Asked him how I liked it. He says, nobody yells at me. It's great. And you can see that he started losing some weight again. Medically, we did phenermine, phenermine 37.5. Simple. Now, this is just a graph of his body comp. Um, on our body comp machine, we don't see people retain all their lean body weight. We typically see a ratio of uh, two pound fat loss to one pound lean loss. Um, and so you can see here his fat uh, pounds is half the height of his lean pounds at his lowest. Look at that, it's about a fifth the height, so clearly he's much leaner. Um, and then what's more interesting is as he's been doing his carpet steaming, he had an uptick in his lean body weight. So maybe some of that weight increase was because he went from sitting behind a desk to being physically active all day. Oh, I threw this in here. This is his uh, lipids. Um, this is kind of interesting. We see this all the time. You start as somebody on a modified fast and their cholesterol goes into the floor. I mean, it goes to zero, but then it comes back up. So you see his total cholesterol dropped quite a bit, but came back up. You see his LDL in blue has come down a little bit. You see his HDL initially dropped, but then swooped up. Look at that from like 42. This line up here is 80. So it's like from 42 to 70. I mean, a huge bump in HDL with his weight loss combined with his physical activity. And then look at those triglycerides. So really the weight loss is really just shifting, uh, lowering the triglycerides, raising the HDL, really nice change over time, but not a huge impact in total. Um, just to refer back, so uh, this is a drug study that was done where they did a one year study and they got the drug approved and every drug study looks the same. This is the placebo, this is the drug. They lost more weight on the drug than the placebo, right? I could pull every drug study of all the new drugs and they all look like that. Just change the, uh, the Y axis and you got the same study. But what they did here that's interesting is they extended it for another year and they re-randomized at this point and half of these people in red on Lorcazarin, they got the drug stopped and switched to placebo. You imagine that, you're flowing along, you're doing great, you lost all this weight and they started giving you placebo pills. And they did that. So should we treat for three months and stop? Should we treat for one year and stop? This is the question you will get from every patient and every doctor. When do I stop treatment? When do I stop my medication? And don't give them this answer, but it's the one I like. I say at the autopsy. <laughs> There's a chronic disease. We use these medications long-term, like blood pressure, diabetes. We would stop the blood pressure medication if it was no longer needed, right? We'd stop the blood pressure medication if the person's 90 and frail and you're worried they're gonna fall down. So certainly there might be an endpoint for these medications, but we think of them as chronic medications. I have another question in the back. Yeah. Is Yeah, so I mean, that's an interesting statement. So what if she met a criterion to start on Crestor because her cholesterol was 300 and now it's only 150? That means it worked. So it's up to you to educate the Wisconsin Medical Society that the drug worked and therefore, and she's a high responder, that's a huge weight loss and stopping it would be particularly detrimental. So I would send a letter to the Medical Society educating them that for a patient that's responded and now you've put the disease into remission, you shouldn't stop the treatment that did that. That's my opinion. But um, you know, there's state laws and state rules. Um, but I think it's worth educating the medical society that you should be basing it on the, the treatment BMI, not the BMI they got to. So the indication is based on where the BMI started, on a starting BMI. That doesn't say it should be stopped. It says it should be stopped if it's not effective, correct? So if they failed to lose weight, it would be stopped. So does that mean you'd only continue it if they didn't lose weight? So it's backwards logic, right? So they're saying you should only continue it if it didn't work. I think it's being stopped is also whether or not it's prolonged or temporary. I think that's what they're saying. 
Um, yes, yeah, so if you have specific state rules about that, then you would need to stop it. If you don't, you can educate them that you think that that loss of whatever, 40 pounds, outweigh those risks. And another thing you could consider, um, sometimes I'm moving patients to a dose of phenamine that I do have long-term safety data for. So from the Sexenda trials, we have long-term safety data on 15 milligram. And I can tell you 15 milligram phenamine in generic form, although um, it specifically hasn't been studied, it's generic, it's pennies a pill, um, and it's the same dose that has been studied. And I think you can send them a copy of the Endocrine Society's document, which uh, explains that they think that that's good medicine. So that's our, our experts, Carolyn Apovian and, and uh, Still, and I forget the other authors, but it's a good paper. And wouldn't it be great if we could get long-term safety data on it? So I wouldn't say that that's an uh, excuse not to do long-term safety data. I'm just not sure who's going to do it. But uh, I would absolutely support trying to find funding to get long-term safety data for um, the older drugs. I've got questions all over the place. Can I put a hold on questions for a minute and try to get through a couple more slides? How much, what's our time at? Oh, let me finish the last couple slides then um, because these are what the questions are on. Limitations of long-term use of anti-obesity medications, right? That the old, uh, they're used short-term because the old drugs encourage short-term use. Some boards don't allow long-term use, but it's just not consistent with current medical knowledge. Um, so I think that speaks to your point. All right, um, this is super interesting slide. If you look at obesity in America right now, 46% of Americans would have an on-label indication to be on anti-obesity medication. 46% on-label. What percent are we using it in? Two. Could you imagine that for any other disease state? Let's take type two diabetes. 9% of Americans have type two diabetes. And of those, 86% receive pharmacotherapy. We've accepted that diabetes is a disease deserving of medical treatment. In America, we have not accepted that obesity is a disease worthy of medical treatment based on this data. Combination therapy, Dr. Heinrich spoke to this. Um, I'm doing more and more and more combination therapy. Again, any combination that you use would be considered off-label, but we would do this for any other disease state. We would do it for diabetes, hypertension, uh, depression, um, and in one study that I quoted here, um, they were able to achieve 31% weight loss using medical combination therapy. 31% weight loss, again, that's getting into the range of uh, sleeve and gastric bypass. I know Dr. Morton generally talks about um, excess weight loss. Did he show, I can't remember, uh, actual weight loss? So actual weight loss on a sleeve is estimated at about 33%. So we're getting into an era where we might be able to achieve similar weight loss medically as what we're doing surgically. I think it's, it, it's coming. Um, a couple more sample patients. This one's super interesting. Um, sorry, I didn't realize Dr. Morton was running out of here. I put this in here just for him. This is a gastric bypass patient. So she had gastric bypass. She'd been a long-term patient of ours. We referred her for gastric bypass. She came back. Um, she came back to the clinic at 250 pounds. This is after her bypass. She was treated with phenamine and she got to 194. I'm sorry, she was treated with gastric bypass at 250 and came to me at 194. Um, at 194, she had been treated with phenamine. She'd been on it for years, but she'd only gone from 194 down to 182. She was stuck. She'd been stuck for years. And uh, she was my first patient I treated with Belvic. I started on Belvic. Back then, it was 10 milligram BID, remember? Now they have a 20 milligram once a day dose. You could do either one. Um, but uh, she only took it once a day. And uh, I saw her back and she totally failed the stoppage rule. Um, she actually gained a few pounds in three months. Remember, Belvic says you should lose 5% at three months. She gained a few pounds. I said, well, we should probably stop it or let's put you on a full dose because you're only taking half of it. She said, no, no, no. I like taking a half dose. I feel really good on this and I think it's going to work. Can I continue it three more months? And then uh, she continued it a few more months, still actually gained a little bit of weight and then raised it to full dose. And then look at this. She started losing weight, losing weight, losing weight, and lost all the way down to 159 pounds, best weight of her adult life, BMI 27. So I was putting this together. I went over this slide with her and I asked her, why did this work? What happened? And she said with the lower chasm, and she says, um, I didn't know what it was doing for a long time, but she just says, when I sit down, um, I used to feel like I either had to finish the plate of food or eat till I was full. And with the lower chasm, I'm satisfied much quicker. 
and I don't feel compelled to finish the plate of food or to eat till fullness. So she, she kind of explained that it works more in the satisfaction part of the pathway, um, but she was very fearful to stop phenamine. She felt like she really needed both. Again, they're used together as off-label. This is um, a 52-year-old male, high blood pressure, heartburn, uh, sleep apnea, treated with phenamine and uh, had a ton of weight loss. Here he moved early to what we called an advance, so he didn't continue on the modified fast. Here we dropped his phenamine dose at his request. He thought it was um, causing the garage cleaning syndrome. Um, then later he decided it was just work stress and we went back on full dose. And you can see he's done very, very well um, uh, down to a weight of 236 uh, body mass index 32. I mean, gosh, it's one after the other. This is uh, a patient that came in the, the day after Contrave was uh, uh, approved. Um, and she was waiting for it to be approved and she came in and I had a sample bottle. I remember when it got approved, they sent me six sample bottles and she got one of my sample bottles of Contrave and she just did terrific. Look, she had this great weight loss peaked at about seven months um, and then was stuck. And then we added 30 milligram phenamine to the Contrave. Again, that would be off label and it doubled down on her weight loss. She ended up going from uh, 331 all the way down to 247. And then a final patient, two more slides on this gentleman, 56 years old, BMI 44, history of lap band, didn't work. Uh, he has uh, type two diabetes on insulin. He has renal insufficiency, abnormal echo, abnormal EKG, developing CHF, because they can't control his hypertension. He's on six drugs and he's still high. I think his blood pressure was 150. Uh, he has sleep apnea that they can't control. Clonidine, valsartan, furosemide, metoprolol, minoxidil, and amlodipine. How much longer does this guy have? Not much. I mean, he is sick as not, and he sits down and he doesn't look old and he's the nicest guy. He runs his own business, um, does these, um, um, what do you call it? The places where you put your stuff for storage, the you store it or whatever you have up here. And um, he's already had adjustable gastric banding. I consider his obesity life-threatening. Do you agree with that assessment? Uh, he has chronic renal insufficiency, CHF, high blood pressure, diabetes, insulin. He is going to be tough. He is going to be tough. And so uh, I put him on a full meal replacement program. That was my initial treatment. That's it, no medication. And did extremely well. I cut his insulin by half on day one, um, like Dr. Heinrich was referring to. Um, and the, oh, excuse me, and I did. I started him on Larcazarin, uh, 10 milligrams, uh, one BID. Um, some notes on some of the other medications. I didn't think he's a candidate for a stimulant. He doesn't have coverage for liraglutide at this point. Um, I thought uh, Belvique instead of Contrave, because Belvique's less likely to speed up the heart rate. Uh, he did have a first degree AV block, which is a relative contraindication. So I monitor e his EKG each month. Lost five pounds in a week, but what was more interesting was he was able to stop his insulin. Um, in two months, he had lost 26 pounds. His cardiologist lowered his metoprolol and amlodipine because his blood pressure was getting too low. He, um, his glucose readings were normal. And uh, I was thinking about liraglutide for him because I wanted to get him off of uh, both of his anti-diabetic medications. Um, at four months, he had lost 36 pounds. I'd sent a letter to the insurance. They denied liraglutide, three milligrams. I sent him another letter. I told him I thought that drug could be life-saving for this particular patient. I asked for an exception. Um, I also pointed out that we'd taken all him off all his anti-diabetic medications. Um, and they, uh, I, got, I got the cardiologist to co-sign it, and we got it covered. Um, we got him on liraglutide, three milligram. He ended up going down 48 pounds. Um, and I kept him off the insulin and the pioglitazone, which wasn't a great option with his CHF. And so his weight loss curve looked like this at a, about a year, down about 13%. So with that, I will close and take whatever other questions you guys have. This has been a Dana Miller Video Network presentation.